And now, the next phase is, what measures were we to take? That's where the committees would have been relevant. From the base information we received from our first committee, we then move into concrete monitoring. And what would have been done if we went into concrete monitoring is precisely where I will come to my conclusion. Fundamentally, they spoke about open markets being restricted. Now, who will do the restriction? And what should the restriction entail? Restriction is to make sure that you do not have congestion, that there will be the safe distancing of the two meters. To ensure that hands are washed, sanitizers provided, to ensure that masks are done. At that time, masks was not part of it. To ensure that those who are in the market, when they leave the market, you will come and sanitize the market. All these are responsibilities. You cannot just make the law, which provides for responsibilities, and you do not indicate who should carry out those responsibilities. So, uh, the Committee on Local Government would have had to be engaged in going to the councils because the councils were charged with the responsibility of providing inspectors who would have to wear uniform, different from all other uniforms. So, you're talking about expenditure. To be able to see that the distancing or safe distancing is actually maintained. It's supposed to be monitored and ensured by inspectors. And they should be provided by the security and by the council. So it means then you have two committees in the National Assembly, local government as well as defense and security. And defense and security would engage the security forces. Have you met have you developed the schemes? What do you need in terms of resource? Local government, the councils, have you met? What do you need? The need assessments will come. The councils will have their technical committees. The security apparatus will have the technical committee. They will provide what they need, supply it to the Minister of Finance, and then you expect that in a supplementary request, they will come and say, these are our needs and the nation should address this. To have a very effective system, a robust system, to be able to fight COVID-19. For the markets, that's what would have been required. Do you have enough sanitizers? How much would you have to spend during the month, two months, three months, the envisaged period of the state of emergency? You could have documented all the costs then those people who are, whose shops have been closed, how much are they losing? The Committee of Trade will come and deal with that, that dimension. What should be the compensation? How do you help those people to be able to survive? As we have said, they've also talked about the transport. The transports are supposed to be limited, but at the same time, sanitation should happen in the transport. Who should do the sanitation? Uh, who provide the sanitation? It's the councils again. They should sanitize the garages, the offices of those people who are managing the garages. So, do they have the resources? This is what should have been assessed, again, by the Committee on Local Government, working with the councils. They've talked about the not only transports like cars, etc., but also canoes, the ferry. You talk about ferry services. They are charged with the responsibility of providing sanitation in that whole area. Sanitizers everywhere. Do they have the finances? How much will it cost? The Public Enterprise Committee should have engaged those people to see what they need. They've talked about the airport, same situation. That when they come, only essential cargoes. 
but they must be quarantined, they must be checked, they must be sanitized, all that will require, again, health, public enterprise. So in short, when you talk about the border security against its defense and security committee, so it means that each committee would have been twinned to an area where we needed enforcement. And they will be checking whether those institutions are properly equipped and properly rendering their services. We talked about health workers protesting. The health committee could have been engaged if the National Assembly was seriously engaged at that time when we set up our first committee and we accepted the 45 days and then start to engage the executive in the way we should have engaged them, then we would not have been in the situation that we are in now. So if we are to move forward, we must take new measures. Fundamentally, you cannot fight anything without a policy. So you need a COVID-19 policy. And that policy must embody two factors. One, a preventive factor. Two, the eradication factor the prevalent factor, defeating the prevalence of COVID-19 in the Gambia. And in order to prevent, that's when you move to the next stage, you require law. What regulations, what laws are reasonably justifiable? The National Assembly has a subsidiary legislation committee. If you make any regulation, you're supposed to lay it before the National Assembly. It will be vetted to see that it is in line with the Constitution. It protects the fundamental rights of citizens and derogatory trade. It will ensure that it is reasonable and justifiable. And it does not violate the language of order acts. So it means that the law can be properly, the regulations could be properly sanitized so that they will not serve the effect that will defeat the purpose of what is reasonable and justifiable in a democratic society. We have the capacity to do that. And the institution is there to do it. So it means not only the policy and the law, but you must move to have a real plan. And that plan is necessary. How do you prevent it? And how do you fight it? must be a part of a plan. It means that the fighting, you need a robust health sector. The frontline defenders, are they well protected? Do they have the protective gears that they need? That is the first consideration. They must have all the protective gears that they need. But that is not enough. They must also be sensitized and assisted at the home level because you can have all the protective gears and come out of it and go to your home and be infected. So how do we have that trajectory where not only at the hospital but at the level of even their homes, their social activities, they will be properly safeguarded and, 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 and protected. That becomes important the resource base that is necessary. You may say that jobs here, payment uh, is, is, is small, and uh, you may not be able to go very far with the budgetary system that we have to say that you are giving certain compensation that are necessary. But this is an emergency situation. And you have supporters everywhere. Can you not create then a special program for those people who are frontline workers. Just like we have programs for people who go to Darfur, etc. Those are the issues that you can discuss with your partners to be able to fight the pandemic so that they will be properly resourced at the personal level, at the functional level. That is absolutely essential. It is important then to follow the chain. The testing facilities, are they adequate? How do you expand them? How do you anticipate a growth in the problem? 
where you quarantine them. How do you do it? Because you look at the situation now, uh, people who are infected, they come from areas. What is happening to the areas where they came from? Is there any engagement with the area? And if you really wanted to do testing, for example, and you cannot do universal testing for every Gatian, that must have been the starting point. You go and find where these people who were infected originated from before the test. And then the whole area could have been quarantined. Not just simply quarantining individual family members. The whole area could have been quarantined. The whole area could have been tested. Those who are employed in the area, you give them leave so that the testing will be able to take place for those 14 days. This food aid that we have, it could have been located to those areas so that those people without will be able to have all the things that they need to be able to survive for a given period where proper testing is done. Then one would say, yes, measures are being taken that are effective. And that is what is required. And you move further to see what happens with people who are coming from abroad. What do we do with them? Some of them may be deported. How do we work with foreign governments so that all Gambians who are outside the Gambia are seen as externally displaced persons? and you sign the contract that for this particular period that we are fighting COVID-19, no government should deport them to the Gambia. Foreign affairs should be able to handle that. And that is the reality. Because people coming can actually infect people who are on the ground. And we can tell our citizens outside, fine, we don't want to miss home. But for this period, could you delay your holiday? So that we deal with this. These are things that we can discuss as a nation and as a people. And need to discuss as a nation and as a people. So in that sense then, we can have a preventive strategy of ensuring that if the thermometers are significant in force detecting, force line of detection, then we must ensure that in all borders, in all public places, Places like even radio stations, etc., they are all supplied with thermometers so that they'll be able to gauge those who come in and the temperatures. And those with high temperature can easily be sent at least to, 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 to have testing. That is the first line of protection of those individuals. And we see those testing as protection, it's line of protection, not line of isolation. And we see even quarantine, not isolation. This, all this terminology should disappear. Let's see it as protective custody of some sort. It's protecting you. It's protective custody of some sort. So that your health can be assessed. And you'll be safe and the nation will be safe. In our view, the nation has capacity to prevent and to fight and defeat COVID-19. Its expansion can be curtailed. But that is inconceivable unless knowledge is the base. Policy moves to help that knowledge and institutions are built to be able to help policy and concrete work plans that could be monitored, evaluated ultimately after proper assessment on a regular basis is done. Not only by the executive oversight machinery but also by the National Assembly. I am convinced that if this is done will be fit to combat COVID-19, will be fit to be able to defeat it.
So instead of moving into that trajectory of fault finding, which if people continue to make certain comments in the media, I personally will be pushed to do that, to debunk what they said about what happened at the National Assembly. Because that is the only way to help minds to be free. Otherwise, you are enslaving minds. All ideas that are wrong must be fought. Otherwise, you are leaving the minds of our people to be enslaved and to be misled. And misled will be weakened. So we need to be strengthened at this time. And consensus can only be built based on truth, based on knowledge, based on conscience, based on the constitution and the law of the country. It is our duty as a people, as representatives of the people, to be guided by conscience, truth, love of country, knowledge, and the national interest. Thank you very much. Well, as we said, that we are talking to the nation and not to a particular sector of the nation. Our point is very clear that if anybody disagrees with this fundamental point, that a state of emergency is nothing but a declaration of a state of alert, that a situation exists in the Gambia that is life-threatening. If you do not agree with that statement, then engage me anywhere any time. But if we agree that that is what a state of emergency means, then let's not engage in any form of uh, hue and cry as to a state of emergency and distort everything. The state of emergency is simply to alert everybody that a life-threatening situation exists on the section 35, full stop. Nobody can say any other thing stated on the section 35 other than that. Now, I mean section 34, I'm sorry, on the section 34 other than that. Se section 34 is nothing stated other than Gambia is experiencing a situation that is life-threatening, full stop. Let's all accept that. I am emphasizing that if, in, if the state comes and you give the state 90 days, that is simply saying 90 days that state will continue to prevail. What is wrong with giving 90 days? Those 90 days, and I should be heard very clearly, the president can revoke any time. On the section 34, subsection 3. The president can revoke that any time. Those 90 days, the National Assembly can revoke any time on the section 34, subsection 5. So if you give somebody 90 days, and before the 90 days the state changes. What makes the National Assembly powerless to revoke it? So there is really no excuse when it comes to giving days regarding a state of emergency other than to respect what the Constitution says that it cannot be given for more than 90 days. It cannot go beyond 90 days. But it can be less than 90 days. Full stop. What is important uh, for us to bear in mind are the measures on the section 35, an Emergency Powers Act is actually enacted, and that act provides for measures. And it is those measures that we should monitor to see that they are repressive or they are not reasonable and justifiable in a democratic society. To be able to do that, it is the committees of the National Assembly that must become robust to carry out their duty. The committees have all the powers. They can summon any minister, they can summon papers, they can monitor anything you have seen with your own eyes in the, in the National Assembly in, in the recent uh, uh, session where committees looked at this gone that were imported, it looked at Simlek, so we can review anything. So therefore we need a robust National Assembly with robust committees to do the money thing. What is more profound is that you've heard the health declare their own regulations. You've heard the president declare regulations. 
the executive should bear in mind that all regulations newly made, if they are not just simply implementing all regulations, all regulations newly made must be laid before the National Assembly to be vetted by the subsidiary legislation committee. That is what is understanding or the 80 of the National Assembly. And with that, then they will be enforced. First, we must screen to see that they are in line with the Constitution, in line with all the laws, in line with good practice. That is what is important. Now, if that is the case, what should we fear? There is nothing to fear, which means that the only thing that we should fear now is our own ignorance. What we must fight is our ignorance to know that this battle can never be won as long as we are keeping our people ignorant and fighting them with things that do not exist, that constitute the figment of our imagination. We have seen regulation in terms of the, 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 the churches and the mosque. When we look at it, if they say a mosque is closed, it's a language that is offensive to many religious people. So when our people, the National Assembly, come to look at the regulation, that is the type of thing that you expunge. Tell the executive, this you must expunge. Don't talk about closing mosques. You're talking about regulating the mass, the churches. Because to regulate them means, well, since people have a right to go to Mecca, but there is a restriction because of the illness. In the mosque, in the churches, you the heads, you can open it. What prevent an imam and, and those people who are in the mosque committee to pray in the mosque with social distancing, respecting everything every day to keep the mosque open. The same thing with the churches the priests and, 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 their, and, and their heads. So it means that it is people who must develop the ingenuity that the spirit of opening the mask is there, but what will lead to, to, to illness will not be, will, will be allowed. And that we should do for ourselves. So it means that in all areas, that is the same situation. If you have naming ceremony, it's the same. If you have barriers, it's the same. Only the essential people will go and do it, and anybody who comes, safe distancing, and you pay your respect. You can do it by phone. People will understand that you are concerned. So we must develop a new culture of protecting people. And that is all that is required. With one mind, one vision, we should be able to handle the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. I um, we've had a lot of regulations being announced, and yet still we see a lot of lapses also in the side of the government and ministry, especially when it comes to the health ministry. We've heard a lot of scenarios where some people have been tested, and still they sit in their homes. They are already tested positive on that, and still they are in their hands. They are not picked up. We've also had scenarios where um, there are people also equally whom you know uh, are violating the rights of um, these people who are already tested because they are not having the treatment that they deserve. We've also equally had where people are, um, the, where the health ministry are announcing figures that are not accurate. What is the National Assembly, especially the committee that is, um, the, let's say the House Committee, are they making a total follow-up when it comes to these situations to make sure um, all the people are protected and to make sure the ministry are telling us the truth? Because a lot of people are complaining of the death figures, the ministry are not reporting the, the, the correct uh, figures of death and not also equally reporting the correct figures of uh, people infected. So I don't know whether the, the um, department that is uh, the committee in the National Assembly that are responsible for these things, what are they doing towards us? Well, thank you very much. I think this is why uh, it's important to have this interaction. I must say there has been a breakdown in the whole machinery of the National Assembly to deal with COVID-19. Once the 45 days was rejected, 
the Minister must not be willing anymore to come to the National Assembly because they can get their 21 days and you are asking them for 21 days. They can get 21 days without proper monitoring from the National Assembly. So it means that what you are saying has proven that what we did was not the best thing. But it's not a blame game. It is a learning process. Not everybody understands the standing orders, the regulations, the constitution. We are all helping each other to situate our powers so that we do not abuse our powers. So what is important, as you have said, rightly said, is that the National Assembly should be engaged when they come up with a declaration, a proclamation, the National Assembly accepts to extend. And once it extends, then all regulations must be affirmed. And the regulation must continue to be monitored. We can do so. But if we do not accompany the process, then there is distrust on all sides, and we don't work as a team. But now, we can work as a team. And if we can work as a team, it means that what you have mentioned, you mentioned certain people who should be kept, but are not being kept, that information will come. Anybody can write a petition to the National Assembly and it will be referred to the relevant committee and investigation will be done immediately to ensure that you deal with the problem. It means that the plant authorities will be called A, B and C, all the information and divert and they must do something about it. It's a matter of course. The power is there to, to make them do what they're supposed to do. So all the things you've mentioned is something that the committees could do something about by engaging the health authorities because when they operate as a committee, they operate like a high court as far as calling witnesses and calling for evidence by force people scum. So that power is in the hands of the national assembly. So there is no doubt that if we reset the stage and get each actor to act in this right place, I am sure that we will be able to reverse the process very soon. And I would think that uh, the, the executive in fact, instead of making new blunders in terms of declaration and time to declare and lapsing, because all that is, uh, is a risk. You keep on declaring and it lapses. I think you can remember I even made a motion for the Vice President uh, to come and answer to the National Assembly and explain uh, the situation of this state of emergencies because uh, there were some elements of, of irregularity from our own perception. Though we cannot say it unless we engage them and it will have been evident from the engagement what they were relying on. So whilst we, we thought something was irregular, we had to engage them to prove that, that, that it was irregular. But unfortunately, because of our own arrangement in the National Assembly, some were talking about President coming, some Vice President coming, so eventually we did not even go on with our own motion to engage the state. And instead, they came to request for extension again, which we do not even allow the debate to start not to talk about extending it. So we, we need to reverse all those processes and help the nation to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, actually, during your speech here, I captured two key important things that I want you to emphasize because uh, we have been following the debate in the National Assembly and most of these uh, members that have voted against the state of emergency, uh, when you ask them, they will tell you that we vote against the state of emergency because we feel like they, they, you cannot just implement or vote for something that will not be implemented. But during your press conference, you said that a state of emergency is just an alarm that a situation emerged in the Gambia and that needs a state of emergency. It's just a form of alarm and that a threat is held in the country. And, but what is key is the regulation and a regulation must come to the National Assembly you know, for it to be it where it is justifiable uh, before it will be implemented, which means that the National Assembly has a take. So, meaning that you can accept the threat that is coming, yes, and declare a state of emergency, but the whole everything is in the regulation. But it looks like there's a confusion here uh, between National Assembly members what is a state of emergency and what is a regulation. But for them, rejecting the state of emergency means that, you know, because the regulations were not in force, why they are two different things. And I want you to set line on this for people to yes, I think this is, is very clear uh, that uh, a state of emergency on the section 34 of the Constitution has nothing to do with measures. It's simply to declare 
that a life-threatening situation exists in the Gambia, full stop. And if you hear from any other National Assembly member anything different, make sure that we share the same podium and uh, debate about it. That is, that is important. Uh, because people sometimes they know the truth and then they, they want to cover uh, the truth. And the only way to have that, uh, that they are covering the truth is to bring them to the forum. So I would advise all media houses that if you are interviewing any National Assembly member who says that a state of emergency means more than a declaration that a life-threatening situation exists in the Gambia, yeah? they invite me and that particular person. So we quote the constitutional provision that says what the person says of rise. I'm saying under section 34 of the constitution, the state of emergency declaration is simply acknowledging that a life-threatening situation may exist or it exists. And on the basis of those two grounds, you can declare a state of emergency. Now, after declaration of the state of emergency, you are empowered under section 35 of the constitution to rely on an act. And that act is the Emergency Powers Act. And the Emergency Powers Act empowered the president to create regulation. And that's why we have this regulation. Uh, but section 35 says that the regulations the measures must be reasonably justifiable in a democratic society. Who is going to check that? It's the National Assembly. Because the National Assembly must affirm. If it extends, it also affirms. And by that affirmation, it must check the regulation. And any regulation that's not reasonable and justifiable in a democratic society, it should make sure that it is reformed. But you do not hold your hands. You have power to check the regulation and say, well, you know, I will not support because they will not, who will do the implementation? You are supposed to ensure that the executive, after taking public funds, does what is required. I think, you know, many members were aware of this, but I think this is more inexperience rather than uh, real desire to sabotage the process as some people are trying to make. I think it's literally inexperience because uh, and I believe all media houses should really engage that committee and my very self so that we explain that, that, that process. Uh, many things happen there which people are still disporting and we cannot clarify because we have to state what our standing on the same, what they were trying to do. You can see even some people try to bring another motion and they were told that you cannot bring a motion on something that had already been decided. All this is, I will say, there has been a lot of inexperience and nobody can be blamed for, for inexperience. But if one wants to persist in that inexperience and try to legitimize it, then that's this policy and no one should accept this policy. And I'm willing to, ready to combat this policy at all levels. If there's no question, I just, because you mentioned uh, where a scenario where you guys summon the Vice President to come and answer the gas of this COVID-19 and the declaration that they made. And it has been uh, since that day we didn't see anything and rumors and speculation have been going that you guys rely on the wrong section, that's why it could not uh, call on the President or the Vice President or come and answer to it. It's rather you guys should rely on uh, a section that you left behind by calling the President himself. But you rather call on the Vice President you know, to come and answer. This is why it could not but proceed. What I'm saying, whoever says this, invite that person and my myself. Let's not get into uh, some of this uh, thing that I will, I'm begging you. I, I consider it triviality, you know. People trying to show that they have knowledge about something that they may not have knowledge about. They may, they may. Invite them. Whoever you think has made the statements, I am challenging the media, invite them and my very self and, and we look at those issues. But I know that I made the motion, but I did not proceed to make a motion for the Vice President to come because I had somebody say, uh, she wanted to make a motion for the president, you know, to, to come, and I said, well, let's see what that motion, because I have not seen anywhere in the constitution where you can compel the president to go to the national assembly. It was not exist. It's out of his own volition. But if he has to come to the national assembly, uh, or she, whoever the president is, that person must be represented by the vice president. It's the vice president who represents the president. 
in the national asset. Now, the issue of motion uh, of a state of emergency, there are a lot of debates on who should bring a motion, whether it is the vice president, etc. Well, bring all those knowledgeable people, 24 hours, and you will debate it, and you will know the truth.